This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners, and that's you right there. Hey, thank you for listening. Maybe you're Howard Yermish, John Atwood, Pat, or brand new patrons. Everybody welcome in Daniel, Ulysses, and Tony. On this episode of DTNS, the U.S. issues AI rules, but are they all for show? Meta's going to start charging Europeans for Facebook and how to turn noise-canceling headphones into heart monitors. Magic. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 30th, 2023. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Blackpink's Jenny Studio, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I thought I'd throw you for a little Monday loop, Tom. That was you nice. did. You Gotta did. keep you on your toes. No more disco napping. Pandering for the blinks. Let's look um, live. You and I from, from Jenny doing quite well out there. So congratulations to her on that solo effort. Apple's having a Monday evening announcement, so we'll be covering those on our Tuesday show. If you're listening to this later, that's why you're not going to hear about that yet. But let's see what's in our Monday quick hits. Western Digital announced it will separate its flash business from its hard drive storage products into two discrete entities in the second half of next year. You may recall that Western Digital bought flash memory manufacturer SanDisk back in 2016. The Wall Street Journal notes, though, that this move effectively reverses that whole merger and spins off the flash division into a standalone business. Yeah, so they're going to sell off the flash memory business is what that seems like. That is what seems to be implied here, yes. Got some good Microsoft news. Windows 11 22H2 now natively supports several new archive formats. So if you're a fan of RAR, 7-Zip, TAR, and GZ archives, uh, and a few others, uh, you can just click on them. No need to do anything else. It does not, however, support password encrypted archive files. You'll need to bring in some third-party support if you want to do those. You can get it now or wait for it to be rolled out throughout November. Less good Microsoft news. The company started showing error codes if you connect a third-party controller to the Xbox that is not part of Microsoft's Designed for Xbox program. If it's part of Designed for Xbox, third-party controller is fine. If it's not, the error code tells the user they have two weeks to stop using that controller before it will be blocked. Microsoft recommends returning such controllers to the seller. That's their mitigation. It's like, yeah, uh, get rid of it. Unauthorized controllers can sometimes be used for cheating, whereas unauthorized controllers also don't make Microsoft any money. OpenAI rolled out a new feature for its pain at chat GPT plus users that lets them upload files. This is a feature already available in chat GPT enterprise. So you might've played around with it, but if you haven't, when you give it a file, chat GPT can summarize it, answer questions about it and generate data visualizations. So let's say you upload a PDF or a data file or really any document with multimodal support that would include an image as well. Qualcomm held a live benchmarking session for reporters to show off how well its new PC processing platform, the Snapdragon X Elite, runs. Uh, The platform is based on Qualcomm's Orion CPU, which was built by engineers who previously worked on Apple's A-series chips. And the benchmarks were really good, outperforming Intel, Ryzen, and a lot of cases, Apple's M2 chips. Uh, however, that comes just as Apple is announcing new chips. So, you know, uh, your mileage may vary how long that comparison lasts. Meanwhile, in other chip news, Asus released a dual RTX 4060 Ti with an integrated PCIe M2 SSD slot. PC Gamer notes that lets you add an SSD in a PCIe lane that would otherwise be taken up by the graphics card. So that's kind of nice. And it will be in a better position for cooling if you're using a motherboard where the M2 slots are located underneath the graphics card. Mastodon has added lists as a feature in its Android app. So if you're using the Android app for Mastodon, or an instance rather, you can create lists and then categorize them on topics or interests. A redesigned homepage also makes it easier to navigate between your feed and hashtags and the new lists feature. No word on when this might come to iOS, though. Mm, They're working on stuff for iOS. That's, That's all they said. All right, let's talk about the president. Yeah, so U.S. President Biden, perhaps you heard of him, issued an executive order, this was expected today, meant to manage the risks of developing AI. So, Tom, let's go through what it actually says. 
All right, we're gonna we're gonna ping pong this. Uh, it requires large developers to share safety test results and other critical information with the government. The president used the Defense Production Act as a justification for this order. It would only apply to the largest developers. So we're talking OpenAI, Google, Meta, Nvidia, maybe Adobe. It'll require the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, a.k.a. NIST, to set, quote, rigorous standards for extensive red team testing to ensure safety before public release, end quote. The Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Energy will use their existing authority to encourage adoption of these standards for critical infrastructure. All right. Uh, they're going to make screening for AI risks a condition for federal funding of life science projects. You want to get the federal funds, you got to screen as a way to protect against dangerous biological materials. The Department of Con uh, Commerce also getting involved developing content authentication and watermarking guidance for federal agencies to use to show which communications are real and not AI generated. Adding AI tools to find and fix security vulnerabilities other uh, than the existing AI cyber challenge. So they're, they're going to add that to the AI cyber challenge. But uh, that one makes sense. Uh, the order is meant to support research to protect people's privacy in training data and take other measures to encourage privacy protection in AI, both in and out of the government. Uh, provide guidance and training about how to keep from using AI in a discriminatory way in housing and law enforcement. The Department of Health and Human Services will establish safety programs and take complaints on the use of AI in healthcare. Uh, they're going to create some guidance for teachers. Uh, provide guidance on preventing the use of AI from harming workers and also issue reports on impacts in the labor market. Encourage the use of resources and training for AI and research. And promote responsible use of AI abroad. And there's some more in there on setting safe standards for the use of AI by the government while encouraging government agencies to use it to improve costs and efficiency, encouraging hiring AI professionals. Uh, you notice there's a lot of guidance in here. Executive orders are not law. They cannot make or change the law. And executive orders can be challenged if they're seen to overstep the boundaries of the laws they use as their justification. Also, a new president can quickly rescind them. They they don't stay on the books like a law does. Uh, Reuters saw the G7's document on a voluntary code of conduct for AI. So that goes along with that. Uh, the G7 is Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Britain, and the US, plus the European Union. Uh, so with that and the UK summit set for the middle of this week, it's a big week for talking about regulating AI. Sarah, this is a lot of stuff coming at once. Who do you think benefits from all of this? Well, I think we all potentially benefit from this. Uh, I didn't see anything in this executive order that, you know, made the hair stand up on my neck, so to speak. I thought, yep, that sounds good. Yeah, that's kind of vague, but sounds good. Yeah, that sounds really vague, but also sounds good. I think uh, certain departments from within the administration being tasked with, uh, you know, coming up with solutions or at least following them closely is not going to harm anyone. Um, I think the more knowledge we have about what's going on, the better. I know that the executive order also doesn't, you know, roll back any rules that current AI systems are, are, are using. Um, it's going to force companies if they think that they're going to get in hot water, if they, you know, don't play nice with the government to perhaps rethink some things, uh, that might be cool tech wise, but not necessarily great for humanity long term. So, you know, I wish I had a better answer for this. I mm -hmm. think a lot of this is let's start this conversation for realsies. That's what this yeah. feels like to me. And we, I don't think that's a bad thing. I just don't know exactly what changes from here. We we need legislation. Uh, that That's the, the long and the short of it, especially regarding training data. You know, there's some guidance in here about privacy and making sure people know about training data, but it's fairly toothless and, and, and fairly vague. Uh, when we need comprehensive legislation, in my opinion anyway, to set the ground rules, to say like, oh, if you're going to use data for 
for training AI, here are the rules. Here's who you have to get permission from. Here's when you don't need to get permission. Uh, Cause that's an entirely new situation. And there's a lot of other safety issues like that. Uh, that said, I don't have a problem with any of these. A lot of it is just good. Like, yes, we should have guidance. And, and it, I guess mm -hmm. it depends on how it's good, good the guidance, guidance is. is what it is. Right. Yeah. yeah. If the guidance isn't good, then this is bad. But if the guidance ends up being valuable, then that's fine. But no, it also doesn't force people to do the right thing. It's just guidance. That, that That's always the nature of guidance, right? I so. mean, I, I would not even pretend to compare something like AI technology to net neutrality, but having the latter be a ping pong issue in the government for some time now, what would be great is if we all kind of go, okay, so here's, here's how AI is going to help us and not, you know, crush the world. Um, yeah. and not have the sort of like, well, that was the law a year ago and then we got a new president and now we got a whole other thing going on and the, and you know, it, it, it makes it more convoluted for the rest of us. Yeah, there's a lot of knee-jerk responses you could have to this, like, oh, this is just political trying to win votes. Oh, it's companies trying to preserve their competitive advantage uh, over new companies by by putting a lot of regulations. It's called regulatory capture. Put a lot of regulations in now that they can afford to comply with them. I don't see much of that here. Uh, it, the, the largest amount of paperwork uh, is applied to the largest companies only. Um, and, and these are, these are again, fairly mild. Now I would be aware of regulatory capture because I do think open AI and Google and meta are all pushing to get regulations put in place. That'll make it harder for others to compete with them. Uh, I think there needs to be some honest discussions about safety and what's actually dangerous and what's actually not uh, so mm -hmm. that you're not doing regulatory capture, but you are contemplating, you know, what unforeseen side effects might happen. Uh, and like I said, I think we need red legislation, but all of that said, like, even with those knee jerk reactions, um, this is not the worst example of the kind of thing that I would be worried about. So I, I think on the whole, it's benign maybe is how I'd describe it. Yeah. At least they weren't like, you know what? AI companies should do what they want. End of story. Yeah. Gavel. Right. It's, it's, <laughs> I guess, that, that would be an issue. So It's an element of the conversation. This is not the end of the conversation, but it's an element of it. Right. Uh, all right. Let's talk about this technology, which I find fascinating. Google has announced research into audio plethysmography. Um, so we'll call it APG <laughs> for short. Uh, it uses hardware for active noise canceling to you sense your heart rate, uh, meaning it can turn any set of noise canceling headphones into heart rate monitors with a soft rate, software upgrade. The ones you've got could become heart rate monitors. Uh, it works by sending a low intensity ultrasound signal into the ear, and then the active noise cancellation mics can detect the echoes of the sound off the ear canal. They're designed to do stuff like that. Tiny movements of the ear canal skin that are caused by blood moving through your, your skin changes how the sound echoes back in a very small way, but it changes them. And the software can use the variations detected to tease out what your heart rate is and even your heart rate variability. It works with music playing, so it doesn't matter if you got music playing, it can still detect these differences because it can just cancel out the music. And even if the seal isn't great, uh, it, it can also cancel out the noise that's that's leaking through. It does have to adjust for body movements. That is one thing that can throw it off. Uh, so Google says they are using a multi-tone approach to kind of calibrate and adjust for that sort of thing. But in a study they did, uh, 153 people had consistent accuracy, like less than 4% uh, problems. So, so pretty high accuracy, not something you'd use in a clinical setting, maybe, but but enough to kind of tell you as you're walking around, hey, this is what your heart rate here. is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so the only noise canceling headphones that I use, but I use them daily, are the AirPods Pro um, that I bought uh, earlier this year, um, and I use the noise canceling not all the time, but the majority of the time, and. Mm -hmm. I I also wear an Apple Watch, but uh, if I was monitoring my heart rate, which that's just part of my health data that I find interesting, but if I was really looking at it closely, and for whatever reason, I either didn't have a smartwatch or I didn't always want to wear one, um, and that was the metric I was going for, this is awesome. Um, I think the, yeah, I mean, this is not unlike you know, you're taking a pulse and that's how you get your heart rate. I can see where, and I never really thought about it this way, 
but I can see where, especially um, when one might be out and about, uh, the that kind of you know blood rushing to an ear or not rushing, but you know it, it, um, giving an indication of of what's going on with the heart makes a lot of sense. I don't exactly know how. I don't know. Is there a firmware update that <laughs> makes this all possible at some point with existing noise canceling headphones that people might have over, you know, uh, using various um, vendors uh, to buy them? I, I don't know, but I, I love this. I mean, it, this is all just like let's let's reimagine data that we actually need. Some people, this data is extremely important. Um, for other, you know, I don't have any hurt problems that I know of. So this is more sort of like interesting and good to take, you know, keep an eye on type thing. So if there ever was anything weird, I would know more about it later. I think, uh, again, everybody wins here. Yeah, there, there are lots of uh, headphones out there that have built in heart sensors uh, right. because there are people who are like, they don't, they can't afford to buy a, a super cool smartwatch or don't, like you said, don't want to wear a Fitbit, but they just want the heart rate. Uh, and especially if you want it while you're jogging, a lot of people wear headphones while they're jogging. Boom. There you go. It's a, it's a simple thing. So yeah, this isn't going to replace uh, fitness monitoring fr from your wrist, but it is an interesting thing to have. And it is something that is easily added to existing headphones and turns them all into heart rate monitors, making it more compelling. I don't have to buy a special pair of headphones to get it. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, I think I think this is this is cool. You hit on the big question, which is: So Google, <laughs> are you going to make this easily available for Sony and Apple and others to use? Are you going right, to hoard right. it to yourself? Uh, are you even going to roll it out to your own earbuds, uh, like the Pixel Buds? Uh, we don't have any kind of sense of that. This is just the study to say, hey, it looks like this works, right? Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know when this rolls out into a product, but I would like it to be soon because I think it's cool too. Me too. Me three. Well, do you think it's cool? Tell us on our subreddit, as well as telling us other stories like this one that you'd like to hear us talk about. Uh, we got a great subreddit community in there. So go over and take a look at it. You can submit stories and vote at dailytechnewsshow.reddit. Back in January of this year, the European Union determined that Facebook, owned by Meta, could not claim a contractual necessity for much of the personal data that it collects on its users. Under the GDPR, any collected info that isn't strictly necessary has to be collected by user consent that is informed, specific, and freely given. In a ruling handed down by the Court of Justice of the EU, judges advised that an appropriate fee could be collected for equivalent alternate services that don't track users. This was non-binding, but it was an element of the court's decision. Meta is using this to justify its next approach, right, Tom? Yeah, it's a little shaky ground, right? The court just said, maybe you could do this. They didn't rule that you could do it. So I'm going to, spoiler alert, the end of this story is everyone's going to take Meta to court uh, and, the, and we're going to rule on this again. Uh, but here's the situation as it stands now. Users in the European economic area. So the European economic area is the European Union plus Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway. So the European economic area and Switzerland, which is not part of the European economic area, but it's part of this uh, policy from Facebook. If you agree to be targeted by ads, you can continue to use the service for free. So what the, what Meta is saying is on Facebook and Instagram, we will give you informed consent. We will tell you, we're going to track you in these ways. Is that okay? If you say yes, keep using it for free. If you say no, you either don't use the service. You just say, nope, I'm not going to use Facebook or Instagram, or you will be given the option to pay. Nine euros ninety nine cents a month, ten ten euros a month. Or if you're signing up through Google or Apple's stores where they take a cut, it'll be thirteen euros a month. After March first, twenty twenty four, they're going to start charging you for linked accounts. So if you have an Instagram account and it's linked to your Facebook account, you won't have to pay ten euros a month for both. Your linked account will cost you either six euros or if, again, if you're going through the app store, eight euros a month. 
ads for users younger than 18 will be paused. So the charge is only if you're older than 18. If you're younger than 18, you will not have to see ads or pay starting November 6th. Meta says that pause will last while it evaluates the impact of new EU regulations, and they'll have more details on options for younger users in the coming months. Now, this hasn't been tested in court, nor has it been approved by the Data Protection Commission. Ireland's Data Protection Commission has jurisdiction over Meta because Meta's headquarters are in Dublin. Uh, it is still evaluating this plan. Meta gave it to them. Uh, but the Meta was said, we're going to put it in place in 2024. The Irish uh, DPC said, we think you should put it in place faster than that. Meta said, okay, we will, but the DPC hasn't finished evaluating itself. itself. It could conceivably come back and say, no, this isn't okay. Uh, but even if it comes back and says, yes, this is fine, I would expect Max Schrems and his organization to take Meta to court and say, this is too much money. This is not what we had in mind. Um, what, what do you think, Sarah? Is, is 10 euros a month an appropriate fee to get Facebook without ads? Well, I wouldn't pay, I wouldn't pay that, uh, which is, you know, let's just say it was $10 a month, which is not too far away from it's good. Yeah. Euros and dollars are fairly close. Exactly. Right. Uh, for Facebook, I'd be like, I don't care about Facebook that much. But if you say that for Instagram, I might go, huh? Well, I really, really hate ads on Instagram, but I also use Instagram on a daily basis. Well, my dog uses Instagram on a daily basis. Oh, not so is much a, me. A prolific user of Instagram. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I'm I'm, you know, his guardian. So you I might have sure to pay things are going ten well. euros for each your and Otis's accounts. Yeah, and that's where it kind of gets fuzzy to me. I wonder how much Listen, I, I know Meta is trying to Meta knows that there are legal battles ahead. Um, and for the company to say, okay, well, for those of you who do not want to be targeted by ads and maybe we're just going to bounce out, maybe some of you will pay. And for that, let's see how many people do do that and the rewards that we, we reap financially. I think this all is going to get torn apart sooner than later. I don't exactly know how. It just seems too easy. Um, yeah. And, you know, for anybody going, I knew Facebook was going to make me pay eventually, <laughs> uh, you know, it doesn't matter where you live in the world. That's not what's going on here. Yeah. You just have to agree to what was already happening. And you can either say, no, I don't like this place. I'm going elsewhere, which you always could do. Or say, actually, you know, how about an ad free experience? That could be a fun, you know way to stay on a platform that, you know, all my friends and family are still on, or at least a way to give it a shot. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I don't live in the EU, so this doesn't apply to me, but this would be something I would try for a month, 100%. It's clear to me that uh, Meta doesn't want to use this to make money. Uh, it, I, I've seen I've seen a lot of people say, oh, this is a cash grab. If that was the case, they would be talking about rolling. I don't think they're going to get enough rolling. cash for it to be a No, they're grab. not. And they would be rolling it. They'd be talking about like, well, and if it goes well in Europe, we might roll it out elsewhere. They're not. They have very clearly said this is only going to happen in Europe. We're only doing it because right. we have to. Mm -hmm. So the big question is going to be whether the courts will say this is an inappropriate fee, at which point, what is the appropriate fee? Is it five euros? And is that enough for Meta to go, okay, it's we, we don't want to leave the European market, so fine, we'll take a loss on the people that sign up. Maybe it won't be that many. They've obviously figured out that 10 euros is going to keep them from losing money. I'm guessing it's got a little padding in there, so they could probably go down a little bit. But what is that number? Is there a number? I have, I have a feeling that, that Max Schrems Group is going to say they shouldn't make you charge at all. That's not freely given consent if your only other option is to pay. I'm not sure I buy that though, right? Because you pay to get rid of ads and lots of things. Like why should Facebook be prevented from offering that? Yeah, I mean, that is one of the huge issues that people have with, well, I was about to say Facebook, but meta in general. I think this is potentially something that will appease a lot of users uh maybe not anybody who works you know in the government sector but uh but yeah 
let's 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 see what happens if if you live in one of the areas affected uh and you're well i don't know if you're under 18 that would affect you as well but if you're over 18 well that's the thing right can you just say yeah. i'm under 18 and get away without ads you can you might get caught and it also restricts what you can do so exactly you may, yeah. may not be worth it to do that right right i know i when i was like Oh, for every additional account associated with Facebook, I'm like, <laughs> Otis you, is younger than 18. Yeah, but I mean, I also have like <laughs> burner accounts that sure, I mean, if somebody really wanted to go after me, they could figure it out. But like, I'm not telling them that that's my other Facebook account and paying more. Come on. Yeah. Agreed. Well, um, what Max Schrems and the Noib group, uh, N-O-Y-B, are, are, are regular folks that are going to fight this on your behalf, Europeans, if you, if you don't like this. Uh, meanwhile, in Japan, giant robots are going to fight on your behalf. Yeah. <laughs> At Japan's mobility show, Yokohama-based Subame showed, it, showed off something called the Arch Axe, a $3 million transforming mecha, meaning a large armored robot. Uh now you might say, well, that's crazy. What in the heck? This one doesn't really do much besides lift its arms, wave to the crowd, and go between robot mode and vehicle mode. This part is actually pretty fun. So the Arch Axe, which only has five sellable models, mind you, has four legs, each with a wheel at the bottom driven by an electric motor. So, you know, it's a car. In vehicle mode, the legs are spread apart, lowering the center of gravity. It can it can reach a blistering top speed of six miles per hour. So, okay, it can move. But transforming to robot mode takes about 15 seconds, where then the machine rises to a height of 15 feet. Uh, uh, mobility show uh, event goers have said, it's pretty cool. And it's real big. Finally, the cockpit is accessed through four separate hatches, which open in sync, revealing the pilot's chair, just the one chair. Once the models are sold out, Subami wants to create a robot league where the models fight each other. And you might say, well, that's a really bad idea, right? Especially when humans are inside. It's only supposed to be in VR. This is fun. Now, this is I like know. a concept car for mechas. I know giant robots are a big deal in Japan, uh, Gundam and, and everything. Uh, the, the, the closer they can make them to being real, uh, the the more likely somebody is to try to make them. And so this doesn't surprise me too much. But Roger, you follow this really close. I know you're 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 a fan it's, of giant robots. I mean, it's I mean, who isn't a fan of giant robots? Sure. Uh, so this totally reminds me of back in 2016. There was a or 20 uh, 2015 2016. <laughs> There was a whole thing where Megabots Incorporated, based down in Hayward, or up for me, up in Hayward, California, uh, challenged the Japanese uh, Sirobashi Heavy Industry, who also created a very similar robot to a robot versus robot duel. Um, and to me, this kind of is half kind of tongue in cheek, like we're going to create a, a giant robot. Other half of, but the other half is creating the technology that allows you to kind of have a large, heavy, and somewhat awkward-shaped uh, piece of machinery amble about without ke keeling over and uh, crushing someone. Uh, this is, I don't want to say this is totally a, a promotional stunt, but um, it's, a, it's a pretty cool promotional stunt. It's a I love mean, of giant robots first, then yes. promotional stunts second in order to try to make enough money to justify doing the thing you did because you love giant robots. That's how I look Yes. It. It is It is definitely kind of a self-referential uh, uh, campaign. I feel like I'm indifferent to giant robots. You know, mm. Roger, you said, who doesn't love them? I, you I sure you want to say that on the I, internet, sir? I, well, I don't. I <laughs> Yes, I am sure. You know what? You're not the boss of me. But when you're uh, sitting, I, when you, when I'm you're indifferent sitting, to them until they really are fighting each other. And then I'll have some thoughts. Then when you'd you're like sitting in your own very, very <laughs> own 30-foot. Like Sarah bot <laughs> that you get to control like a giant. I don't want to do that. I mean, maybe. You say, maybe. That, say now. that now. You say that now. <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys. Okay, you know what? When the apocalypse hits, I'll be I'll be getting in there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. watch out world because I will not be fighting in VR. This is. No, I know. This I, is the real in deal. Fact, VR That's was a reason. just training for you, Sarah. Now you can We need some regulations on giant robots for the exactly <laughs> yeah. Biden, where are you when we need you? All right, let's check out the mailbag. 
Let's do it. On Friday's GDI, we were talking about whether we would like to look into the future or the past if we had to choose one. That inspired Alan to post a comment on Patreon. Alan said, The time travel discussion reminds me of a story by Isaac Asimov called The Dead Past. He says, spoilers incoming. This was written a long time ago, so I think we're okay. Alan says, roughly, it's about some people who invent the ability to look back in time, but they get shut down by the government. At first, all the viewing was distant past, but as they got closer, they got government interference. The reason is that the past ends a split second ago. So basically, the device was the ultimate spying device, which is why the government stopped them and also how it thwarted their plans. Mm. Asimov liked, likened the ending, uh, liked ending his stories with a twist, and I'll always remember this one. That is a really interesting premise um, because broadcasts are much more delayed from live than they used to be. When everything was over the air, there was a little bit of delay between something happening and you seeing it or hearing it, but not much. Of course, now over the internet, there's so much more latency in there. Uh, I, I actually heard that the CBC has uh, has ended its one o'clock p.m. long dash, which was meant to let everyone in Canada calibrate their clocks to know exactly when it was 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, because digital broadcasting means that it doesn't happen at exactly the right moment that it should anymore. It's not not as good at calibrating. I thought it meant so everybody in Canada had it, had to run in a that's dash. Now, yeah, now they all have to do a 100-meter dash. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Latency, no, um, it'll get you. But but that idea of of like if you look into the past, the past is just a split second ago. Uh, yep, there you go. Mm. All right, folks. If you like these kinds of conversations, we have them in Good Day Internet. Patrons get the extended show. Stick around. Phone maker Nothing has put out its own beer. Now, granted, they partnered with a brewery. Like, yes, it's it's a publicity stunt, but. We have a report on how it is, is a decent beer, and we started thinking about what drinks other companies might want to put out. Perhaps Apple, Andrew Langson from CNET suggests, might want to put out a vodka. We're going to talk about it. Stick around. And that sentence by Tom is now in the past. You can also catch the show Monday through Friday. We do it live, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. For a little bit longer, anyway. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. That URL is there. It's just that there's a time change looming in the U.S. We are back tomorrow with Charlotte Henry joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>